do tonight's event. I just wanted to, uh, just to, to kind of say a few words just about um, our next exhibition at Arctic Space, which opens on Saturday, uh, titled Frozen Lakes. It's a group exhibition, and one of the artists uh, participating in the, in the exhibition is Tobias Casper, um, who is one of the editors of Provence, which was uh, yeah, it's a round of applause for you. <laughs> was the kind of primary um, reading for us, in a way, uh, also taking the opportunity to have this launch event tonight of Provence issue E, uh, which is the eighth issue of Provence, maybe a little, no, seven, six, six. <laughs> <laughs> I can't count, six, okay, there will be eight issues in total. Um, so I'm going to just hand straight over to Hannah Stockinger, who's one of the editors, or the editor with Tobias of Provence, and he's going to introduce tonight's event, but also I'd like to say that we're very happy to have Susan Bonofsky here with us tonight. Um, it's great to have her speaking, um, and nice to see more people around. So I'll hand over, hand over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and um, thank you for having us here. And thanks to all of you for coming to Art Space tonight. Also, uh, thank, you, thank you very much to Chen who organized and uh, prepared for our launch of the magazine. Um, special thanks to Susan and Marty, um, who agreed to give a lecture on Robert Walter and Michael Skips on the occasion of our release here in the yard now. And uh, um, I only want to speak very short, very briefly, but uh, before I pass the word to Susan, I want to just a brief introduction to the project for Mons, um, especially for all of you who haven't followed what we did in the last years or who maybe never have heard of the magazines. Does it work? It's, yeah, good, <laughs> okay. Um, in 2009, the first issue, issue P, has been launched, and since then, um, six issues have been um, published, and each is issue is depicting um, one letter of the word Provence, and right now we are at the first E, not the second one. And from the very beginning, we've been working from a single regional office in Nice, in the Rue Geofredo number 50 which became more and more the actual base of our activities. And in 2012, we had an exhibition with Berlin Carpenter in this office. Um, our interest in the city of Nice has been ongoing since 2000. Uh, as in 2011, we published a travel guide on the city. And this travel guide is also on view on the table in the first room. Um, for this guide, we adopted the structure of a wallpaper city guide and started to do some research on the city of Nice, the history of tourism at the Riviera, and finally went to the city to take some images of um, the city and its surroundings. Um, on one hand, this guide is a functioning tool to explore the city, and um, on the other hand, it's an investigation into the history of tourism and the Côte d'Azur. Um, the texts in this city guide are, is a compilation of texts written about Nice in travel guides since 1880. I'm pointing to this strategy um, as issue E is also an appropriation of another magazine and issue E is um, related to uh, Madame. Madame is an in-flight magazine of the company Air France and it's also on view in front of there. And we invited several people to contribute and to fill those pages and now it's led to a magazine that, is, um, that combines critique and um, simulation and eco shares. And maybe um, other questions related to Provence can be asked afterwards. Also in front of, um, um, there at the table of some beer. Um, but now I'm going to give over the word to Susan Benowski, who has um, accompanied Provence since, I think, 2009. Not really accompanied, but um, you made possible that two texts by Robert Lanza have been published in Provence in the second issue. And um, now you, for the recent issue, you wrote an introduction of the Walter, and um, we also have the story a dry inside, and so I think you will speak some words on Robert Walter and his history now. Thank you very much. Hmm. If I talk like this, can you, does the microphone pick me 
Okay. I asked for a microphone because I'm getting over a cold and my voice isn't so strong. So rather than make you listen to croaking, um, yes, you listen to my microphone, microphone voice. And now, thank you so much for coming out and thank you so much to, to Richard and Jenny of Artist Space for having me and Tobias and, and, and Hannes of, of Provence for including me in the magazine to begin with. Um, I'm really thrilled to be part of this beautiful beautiful project, and I'm going to take this out so I can move around a little bit. Um, so I'm going to do a short short show about Walzer. It's not going to be very long. There'll be some pictures, and afterwards there, I've been asked to do question and answer if anybody wants to do that. If you don't want to do that, we don't have to do that. It's optional, like so many things. Um, how many people here actually know something about Walzer before I start with like basics? Okay, a bunch of people, but not, not everybody. So for, for those of you who don't know anything about him, um, that's so awesome that you're here, um, because now I can inculcate people. Um, he's one of the very, very great modernist writers, um, Swiss-German, and he was not as well known as some of the other great modernists, but his contemporaries, Franz Kafka, for example, was a great fan of his work. And in fact, when Kafka published his first book of stories, Robert Musial, the author of Man Without Qualities, reviewed Kafka's first book and said, oh, here's an interesting new writer of the Balzer type. Um, so, you know, they, they were contemporaries and, and put in a similar category aesthetically. Um, but he, he, was undis he, was, he was forgotten for a while in the German-speaking world, and his rediscovery then came late, which is why his discovery in English has come even later. In the early 1980s, there was a moment of discovery. Christopher Middleton had been translating him, and Susan Sontag became a fan and did a lot for his publicity. So there was a, a wave of interest, and then it sort of lulled. And now New Directions has been, has been publishing him, both Christopher Middleton's translations and my translations um, in beautiful, beautiful editions, some of them designed by, by Laura, sitting right here, Laura Lindgren. Um, in any case, I'm going to show you some of his late manuscripts and talk about his work. And they're called microscripts because they're very tiny writing. And I'll show you what, what we're looking at. Oh, this is Robert Walzer in um, 1906, 1907, when he's a young, hopeful, aspiring novelist. Um, like so many Swiss artists of the time, and even now, he moved to Berlin for a while to try things out there. It's sort of like the you know, the New York of, of German-speaking Europe, in a sense, although he then wound up back, back in Switzerland, but he moved to New York as a, uh, sorry, moved to Berlin as a young man, wrote, wrote books about Berlin before, before returning. This is him in his, in his young phase, but the microscripts, the work I'm going to be talking about tonight is his late work, and a lot of people find it his most interesting work. They're called microscripts because his manuscripts look like that, now, what you're looking at is a manuscript that's six by eight centimeters, um, and it contains the equivalent of two printed pages of writing. There's a lot of writing on there, and obviously, in the, in the blown up, it's made very fuzzy, but um, he, it, you're looking at handwriting between one and two millimeters high, and there's a lot of mystery about these manuscripts. Um, when no one had ever seen one until after his death, but after he died, a, a shoebox of 526 of these tiny manuscripts was found, um, and nobody could read them. They're, they're written in, in normal German handwriting of the time. It was an older form of handwriting called Kuchens, which people don't really write anymore, but it's a very up and down script, and it, it lends itself to being small, but uh, a mystique then developed around this tiny, supposedly illegible writing, which persisted for decades. Um, but then it turned out they were deciphered. Um, actually, I should just skip ahead and show you this. Um, one, two, this. Um, this is a copy of, of a magazine published in Switzerland, which still exists, called Du. Um, I don't know if some of you know it, but it's it's a maybe a forerunner of Provence in a tiny way, um, um, but a, a Swiss magazine of culture and arts. And this, um, this is a page 
from it that came out the year after Walzer died. He died in 1956. This came out in 1957, and his his the the guardian of his of his estate, um, Karl Zele, printed a page from a manuscript in order to demonstrate that it was, you know, an illegible secret code. Um, Walzer had spent the last 23 years of his life in a mental hospital, and so, you know, he said, okay, he's mad, he's writing code. Um, but then he blew, he blew up an excerpt, and um, this was published, and it was read um, by many people, including in Germany. Um, one young doctoral student was actually writing a dissertation about Walzer, who looked at this and said, wait a minute, I can read this. And he was able to make out the one and the other word there. And so, you know, the discovery was made that, that this was actually writing, writing that could be read. I'm going to go back up to, to the, this manuscript. So this is from 1928. And Walzer developed this, this method of writing as far as we can tell. We don't know exactly why, but he, he talked about have, having had difficulty writing, um, getting cramps in his hand and getting writer's block associated with his hand cramping. And he said that writing these pencil manuscripts, they were inevitably always in pencil, freed him up and made it easier for him to write again. And he started doing this at some time between the last 10 and 15 years of his publishing career, so starting in the late 19-teens to um, 1933. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I lost my train of thought. That's not useful. Um, one moment, it shall return. Yes. Oh, that's what it is. So, in his work, the further on you get in the career, in his career, the more experimental and strange his work becomes. And he really is one of the great writers of high modernism, where he's no longer interested in telling stories in the 19th century mode, but rather talking about the talking, the talking itself. What does it mean to tell a story? The language, his language becomes more and more dense, and you'll see when I read you a story, which I can do in a couple of minutes, um, that it's not really so much about what he's saying as how he's saying it, and he plays a lot with language as a medium. And as a result of this, he found it more and more difficult to get his text published. So obviously, if you write like this, you do not send this off to a publisher. Um, the fellows who deciphered his work think that he may himself not have been able to read these manuscripts if he let them sit too long. So he would write the manuscripts and then copy it over and make a beautiful fair copy of his beautiful copper plate handwriting and send it off to publishers and he was publishing in a lot of newspapers and magazines. You can tell that he copied off, copied one of the manuscripts if you see these lines, you know, those diagonal lines in it. When he got to the end of a page, he would make a mark, and so you could see, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five full-size pages on this one small manuscript. Okay, and he was oops, going in the wrong direction. We were back to do, and here's a manuscript showing centimeters, just for scale. This one contains the story Neujahr's Blatt, New Year's page, which is the first story in the book Microscripts, which is the book I'm going to be reading stories from, although this one story, the one I'm going to read, was published in, in Provence as well. This is Robert Walzer's actual handwriting, and this is a letter that he wrote when he was briefly, as a young man in Berlin, the secretary to the um, gallery Berlin Secession, which you know, those of you who study early 20th, who know about early 20th century German art, it was a, a group, a group, you know, Max Lieberman was part of it, it was a, a group of breakaway artists who had said we're going to get away from the, the art establishment and make our own gallery. And Robert Walzer was, was briefly the secretary of this, which was catastrophic. He was apparently the worst secretary ever. And this is a letter that he wrote to Walter Rathenau, who later became the foreign minister of Germany, but at the time was just a sort of wealthy young man about town. And he writes him a letter reminding him that he um, promised to buy a painting, and would he please hurry up and come actually buy and pay for the painting, because the profits have already been used up, i.e. drunk, is <laughs> the word that's his beautiful copy play handwriting when he was writing.
properly. Okay, so some of the pieces of paper that these manuscripts were written on, it was, it was never just a, a notebook page. It was always recycled paper, scraps of things that he'd found somewhere. So here's a piece of a mailing that he cut to size, Tzachas means printed matter, so there was some sort of periodical in here, and then he turned it on the side and wrote on it. <clears throat> Here's another one, the Zaha from Tzachas, so printed matter again, and this one comes from Prague, and it, it, you can see it says Czechoslovakia along the top. Um, and what you're looking at here is prose texts and then poems. So he would write a number of different, different sorts of writing on one, one sheet. So this one is um, clearly a, a receipt for an honorarium that he was paid. So, so <coughs> someone sent him, sent him a check along with this receipt, and he turned around and wrote on it. This one's particularly interesting in that he decided to scratch out some of the um, poems to protect them from, I guess, his own eyes, since no one else would have been reading this. But he scratched out some of the poems such that he, he clearly would not have been able to read them anymore. Here we have a letter. Um, this is a letter sent to him from the editor of the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, big Zurich newspaper, which is still an important Zurich newspaper. And the, the editor is actually writing to him to accept some stories that he sent him. So this is a happy letter. Um, none, nonetheless, or because it's a happy letter, I'm not sure, but the entire thing gets covered, gets covered with, with, with writing. Here's a card that was set, set, tucked inside a book that was sent to him, and we know what the book is because um, he scratched out some of some of the writing. And this is the this is the card that is the standard publishing language, you know, sent courtesy of whatever is that the publishing house language now. Um, here it says um, humbly submitted in the commission of the author by Paul Salme for live, the publishing house Paul Salme. But he scratched out the word of the author, and he wrote in there of des armen Mexicans, of poor little Max, um, or he uses a diminutive for Max. And Max is actually Max Pote, who some of you may know from, from Kafka land. He was the, the best friend of Kafka, the one who made the decision not to destroy Kafka's manuscripts. Max Pote was also a novelist himself, apparently a not terribly distinguished one, or at least Walzer certainly didn't think so, um, and also a newspaper editor in Prague, and he published some of Walzer's work, and he said he sent Walzer a copy of his latest novel, and we have a letter that Walzer then wrote to Max Port about this novel, and it says, thank you so much for sending me your novel. I was quite astonished to read in the accompanying letter that you had spent two years writing it, because really, reading the book, you wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> not, 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 not entirely kind. Here's a story, here's a, here's a, here's a microscript that contains one of my favorite Walzer stories, um, sort of Cleopatra, which I'm not going to read tonight, but which is, which is in the book. Um, it's a little long for reading. Um, but he talks about Cleopatra as this a modern-day figure who is miserable because the sort of authenticity of true feeling that used to exist in olden times is no longer here. So modern life is things are too fast. You know, modernity has deprived us of our ability to have feeling. Um, this is also going to be a theme in the story that I'm going to read in a minute. And here we have the story I'm going to read are part of it. So another sort of paper that he liked to write on was calendar pages. And what you're looking at here is the front and back of the same sheet of paper. And the sheet of paper is one half of a page from a tear-off calendar. So you would buy the entire calendar as a packet of everyday rip off a page, and there'll be some sayings on it. Here are some quotes in Latin as well as German. Um, I couldn't tell you. Um, but he turned it over and wrote a text on the back. And this is, this is um, a text dating from the summer of 1927. Now, 
A little later, in the winter of the same year, the November, December of the same year, he wrote another text, and he decided to take that prose, that chunk of prose from the top, and insert it into the story that he had wrote, that he had written half a year before. And so this is a story in which the frame tale got written before the middle part. So summer 1927, he writes the frame tale. 1928, he writes another story that he decides to put into the middle of that one. And then another six months passes before it gets it published. So in May 1928, he gets it published in the Berliner Tagblatt, the newspaper. And I'm going to read that story. And this is the one that's published in Provence as well. Story, where are you? I'll read if I can find it. So here it is, it's called The Drive. Assuming I do not merely imagine this, one evening I carry a school child into a house in my arms. A second little girl uttered the request, carry me too. Did there not once exist an illustrator by the name of Tuman? And was not in his day my sommelier a celebrity in the field of drawing? Whatever became, for example, of Felix Dahn's at epic life's work, he's all being real artists of some renown in the 19th century, now forgotten. Meanwhile, I experienced the drive which may or may not be of lasting value. Once, a charming young lady went to see a jurist to ask that he shield her from a girlfriend's vengefulness. While sojourning in a town that is by no means a major capital, I managed to sustain the pleasurable illusion that I found myself in the metropolis. Constantly I discover as yet undesecrated corners within my being. One of my esteemed colleagues has written to me saying he's offered his way to ownership of a country estate. Rather than embarking upon an outing on foot, I accepted a friendly offer to get into an automobile, and while I rode in it, masterworks of the current age went possibly unread. At a restrained speed, I rolled along. My query to the driver of this vehicle, whether my smoking offended her, met with a courteously negative response. Philistines are always fearful regarding poets and their ilk, that they might be a bit off their beam. At one point I rode past a driver repairing his motor car, at another past a temple still under construction. That drivers must be tolerant, placid, accommodating, was demonstrated most delightfully in the course of this satisfactorily progressing drive. The road led past rock formations and into a provincial town that saw me for eight years assiduously turning out and meticulously polishing prose pieces. An elegant public square was tidily traversed. Girls out walking and gentlemen seated in cars gazed at me as at something like a personage who knows how to live. Air brushed past my brow. From time to time, a lurch or stop occurred that was transformed into new swiftness. Unhesitating journalese is surely not among my ample capabilities. I am not in error if at times I see myself as maladroit. Roads appear to rush toward me. A bridge seemed to me almost too narrow. In an industrial town, a cinema came to my attention. There was nothing for me to do but sit still. Behind me lay expanses of countryside, before me as well. Now and then, another traveler overtook me, only then to lag behind. At times, the road appeared vaulted like an arch. The car danced, flew, swam, played, laughed, skipped. I believe myself entitled to draw suitable or unsuitable comparisons between slowness and speed, slipped since I found the moment appropriate, a slim work of popular fiction from my portfolio or valise, and then took from this publication, which was perhaps not without its charms, the following strange tale. New page, right? Um, teacher and Parson. So he's reading the story in the car. 
The village rooftop smiled. Shimmering sunlight beamed flirtatiously down upon the inn on whose doorstep loitered the daughter of the house. Quite possibly she'd been eating radishes, a few remnants of which perhaps lingered between her blindingly lovely teeth. Earlier it, had, earlier it had been morning, later evening gradually arrived. The sky had begun to resemble a richly embroidered little coat. Fir trees stood upon the slope. Poets, who appeared simultaneously to be philosophers, composed five act plays while reclining against the slender trunks. The moon's sickle appeared to be saying yes to life in every regard, something that proved too difficult for a school teacher racing from door to door with an illegitimate child in his arms, finding no agreement within himself. One of his pupils gaped in astonishment, quite comprehensively, of course, to see this figure so long secretly revered now tearing about. At the inn, woodsmen and huntsmen played cards. Before a house that appeared to be remoteness itself stood a woman who, as you could see just by looking at her, had occurrences behind her, and before her she beheld a perhaps even richer panoply of experiences. Her very tended hair resembled a collection of short stories. Wilder, by the way, most kind-hearted pedagogue, still knew not what to do with his innocent burden. The child's mother, who looked on life in such a way as if the coming days were a toy trumpet to tootle on, or a little drum to bang with sticks, lay in bed murmuring to herself, might he underestimate the irreplaceable? The pastor said to the teacher, whom he encountered in their freedom of movement, they are hard and at the same time must do battle with their own weaknesses. The child was heart-wrenchingly beautiful. The pastor's face, <clears throat> the pastor's face, beaming with spirituality, possessed, as it were, something situation restoring. In his spiritual alienation, the teacher hurled the babe, whose behavior called up no blame of any sort, willy-nilly at the pastor. A course of action that appeared to presume that the clergyman would now selflessly provide for the child's future. The existence of this village seemed to go back for centuries. In the schoolhouse, an evening of recitations followed soon hereafter. When I had absorbed this literary commodity, a railway crossing barred my way. The driver and I waited patiently until the train had passed. Fleetingly, I thought of the plaint of the poet who had seen fit to write me that his life seemed to him like a word that had been uttered too often. What I have succeeded in uttering troubles me, not in the slightest, since anything I happen to write I soon zealously forget. In this car, I also flew past her, the woman I abandoned, which isn't even true. I just imagine it from time to time in order to suppose that she is thinking about me and that she and I together comprise a novel. So that's an odd little, kind of typical late Valzerian story. It's a bit essay. The, the, you know, the, the motor car is a novelty for him, you know, and so he's, he's talking about the, the strange way of moving through the landscape, and at the same time he's sitting there reading a book, and not just, not a quality novel, but, you know, a little penny dreadful that he, you know, he talks about buying at the train station. Some of his stories are um, retellings retellings of this little, little plot-driven bad books. And, and I'm, so I can read another story, or we can go to Q&A, or Jenny, what's my cue? Here's Jenny. Uh, what do you think? I think you should read another story. OK. Um, I'll read one more story. Do you, want, do you want a story about sex, or do you want a story about alcohol? No, no, pick one. It doesn't be too long. People will get bored. Sex. Sex. Okay, here we go. Okay, so if it's the one about sex, I can tell you right now that this is its manuscript. So I'm going to read you this story. You can read along. This story is called Swine. Swinish in matters of love, 
and might even succeed in justifying himself to a certain extent. In my opinion, various possibilities would appear to exist with regard to swinishness, etc. Someone might happen to look like a person who appears to be a swine, and all the while he is at bottom perhaps fairly upstanding. One can say with a rather large degree of certainty that men seem to possess a greater predisposition and talent for swinishness than women, who of course are now and then capable of achieving excellence in this regard. Without a doubt, one could find tremendous swineliness in the amorous relations between, say, a man and another man. I belong to the faction of humanity willing to be convinced that men are more in need of love than are women, who often enough realize that when it comes to what goes by the name of love, they are, no, they are by no means living high on the hog. Would it not be permissible to make so bold as to find it lovely when, for example, some layabout Lothario has a lady friend, or if you will, a goddess whom he worships, and then one day makes the acquaintance of a young lad who pleases him because the boy's features and build remind him of the appearance, character, and conduct of his beloved. By the way, I consider renunciation and manners of love to be almost certainly at times a virtually marvelous thing. And yet, I believe there are many who have no desire or lack sufficient emotional or other fortitude to share my opinion in this regard. Now and then it comes to pass that, it's hard to it. now and then it comes to pass that women fall in love with women in some manner or other. Whether these women are refined or rather the most utterly dainty and delicate swine, appears to me a question scarcely requiring response. Instances of, instances of delightfulness are always intrinsically beautiful, so to speak, and yet, under the right circumstances, they may be swinish as well, for what is humanly beautiful might, as it were, be too beautiful for human beings, for which reason people are glad to place it in proximity to pig pens, as one is no doubt justified in saying. To me and several others, it is clear that the willful confusion of the beautiful with the bestial is, in a matter of speaking, fun. Now, an undeniable imperative can indeed be found in attempts to ridicule what is beautiful, dear, and sweet, what is, in short, generally welcomed. For while pleasure does not, in and of itself, entail morality, which is certainly alarming, it appears to elicit satisfaction when contrasted either directly or indirectly with material of a moralizing nature. It can no doubt be assumed with no small justification that never being anything other than jolly and merry is well suited to compromise civilization. Does not the endlessly endearing drag us down? If morality itself can, as it were, be a bit swinish, no one will wish to undertake to deny that it is a useful, that is, a culture-promoting swine. If, however, immorality robes itself in nothing but grace and beauty, one is left feeling obliged to suspect that it will provoke distrust and a need to engage in cautionary measures on the part of society. As a matter of principle as well as whim, I am now hurling my recommendation onto the page let precautions be taken to avoid untoward beauty and happiness on the part of the beautiful and happy, while also, with no less zeal, seeing to the avoidance of excessive deprivations on the part of the disgruntled. No one can claim that he is not a swine. It's Robert Balls on sex. Um, I, as, as you may have guessed, there's sort of a pansexuality going on pretty much throughout his work. And I'm reading, I just moved houses, so I couldn't actually find my copy of this book. So this is actually a bound page proof of the, of the volume Microscripts, which is on sale in the front in both the first edition, which is a hardback, and the, the paperback edition, which has the advantage of having art by Myra Kalman in it, but the first edition has the advantage of being a beautiful hardback that has a, um, a microscope facsimile on the front cover that basically is like a real thing, you, would, you know, 
it's, it's glued on the front cover, you can't tell it, it's not real. There are, there are issues of Provence uh, for sale on the front too, and you should all look at those. But there's time for questions, if anyone has questions, or we can skip that and go right to drinking, or, you know, you tell me. If anyone has questions, And so all the valuable manuscripts are in the National Archive under high security and all that 
but you can go there and look at them. It's not so such a big deal. And the actual that Robert Foster archive has all the materials that are you know not of you know great bibliophile value, not the manuscripts. But they have all the first editions, and they have a lot of really interesting papers. So one can visit that, and they put out exhibits of Walzer's work. So a real Walzer visit to the band involves going both to the archive, the Robert Walzer archive, and to the Swiss National Archive. <coughs> Bern is a beautiful, beautiful town. It's very much worth a visit. Gorgeous, gorgeous town. And Walzer lived there for for seven years and wrote a lot of stories about the town also. Sorry. Yeah, you were saying that he's being kind of forgotten in English. He's this kind of forgotten modernist in English. But is the situation markedly different in German as he retained an influence? Because W.G. Sebel has spoken about his influence, for example, and there are others. Okay, but Zabel is interesting because that's an example of an author who is much more revered in the English-speaking world than in the German-speaking world. In Germany, if you talk about Zabel, is the great German author, but like who? Um, not everybody. I mean, he's, he's known, but it's, his level of stardom here is much, much, much higher. So, you know, Walzer is, is goes without saying, but he's considered a major modernist, right, in all the German-speaking countries. I mean, certainly Switzerland, you know, he's Switzerland's great writer, you know. The Swiss, the great Swiss writers, you know, Gottfried Keller in the 19th century, Robert Walzer in the 20th, in the early 20th, late 20th, Frisch of Durenlot. Who am I leaving out that are, are these my, the most important? Am I leaving out anyone important? Gotthelf? I love Gotthelf. I, I translated some Gotthelf, 19th century, great. I did a play, Schwarze Spinner. Anyway, um, but he, he also has gotten a lot of attention now. He's gotten actually a lot of attention in the art world, I think because of these manuscripts, which are interesting as objects and have a sort of mystery around them. Um, has there been any research on the relationship between the text he wrote on the paper and, and the sort of paper? Actually, not that I know of. That would be an interesting project. Maybe you should do this. Um, I mean, in, in a couple of cases, like in, in one, one case, oh wait, no, I, my page first don't have all the illustrations, but in this, in this book, Microscript, there is one example. You know, I, when, I, when I mentioned that he would buy these like cheap little novelettes and steal their plots, there's one example in which he tore the cover off one of these cheap little novelettes and on the back of the cover wrote a story in which he stole the plot of, of it. Um, that's in the book. And it's, it's a hilarious story. So occasionally it's very clear correspondence, but that would be interesting. I mean, my theory about it is, is that it was probably somewhat randomized because I think, I, I imagine him sitting around with a lot of these pieces of paper kind of in his room Picking up one where there was a blank space and then being inspired by the size of the space that was left and doing something. I was sort of thinking about Schwitter's what, what if there was maybe something in the air around I don't think that he knew anything about it, but he was before, when was, she was before Schwitter's. What was Schwitter's exactly? Teens. Teens. Okay, so no, he wasn't, so he overlapped exactly with Schwitter's. As far as I know, he never heard of Schwitters. As far as I know, he didn't know Schwitters, but I've never seen. He, he doesn't comment that much about artists of the time. He comments much more about older artists and also older writers. He comments very, very seldom about his contemporaries in any of the arts, except his brother. His brother was, oh, his brother in their lifetimes was much more famous than he was. Um, he was a painter and stage set designer who moved to Berlin before Robert Walzer. Karl Holzer was his name, and he was the most sought-after stage set designer in all the major theaters, and really had a, made a huge name for him. He was Max Reinhardt's, you know, d production designer, and painted frescoes on the, you know, inside the country homes of all the you know, German diplomats. He was a big deal. No one knew, no, you know, when, when Robert was the, the young writer, it was like, oh, you know. Carl was sort of, you know, handsome and suave and dating actresses and all this stuff. Um, he had this kind of bumpkin like younger brother who, whose German had a heavy Swiss accent, and that was Robert. And then they, they would go to these parties, and there, there's, part, there's, there's letters 
to Carl, inviting him to dinner and saying things like, you may bring your brother, but only if he's not too hungry. <laughs> Any other questions, or is it time for us to drink? Maybe that's, yeah, maybe it's a good place to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. All the books and magazines are available to purchase. Thank you.